Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back, everybody, to another chapter of A Court of Mist and Fury, written by Sarah J. Moss and read by yours truly, Free Wada, with the exclamation point, or the added emphasis, if anyone doesn't know, I just read it, I just read as we go along, we do it one shot, one take, unless something crazy happens in the middle of recording, I, um, Passage of time, currently I'm on my lunch break, and figured I could get another chapter in while I'm waiting for my food to heat back up. I was putting it in, on, in a, it's in a crock pot right now, and it's warming up, so I figured I have a little bit of extra time for it to heat up, get a little chapter out, and then maybe eat some food. <laughs> and let's get back into it with no, no previous, no previous explanation of the last chapter into some chapter eight. A week later, the tithe arrived. I'd had all of one day with Tamlin, one day spent wandering the grounds, making love in the high grasses of a sunny field, and a quiet, private dinner before he was called to the border. He didn't tell me why or where, only that I was to keep to the grounds, and that I'd have sentries guarding me at all times. So I spent the week alone, waking in the middle of the night to hurl up my guts, to sob through the nightmares. Ionthe, if she had learned of her sister's massacre in the north, said nothing about it the few times I saw her. And given how little I liked to be pushed into talking about things that plagued me, I opted not to bring it up during the hours she spent visiting, helping select my clothes, my hair, my jewelry, for the tithe. When I had ex asked her to explain what to anticipate, she merely said that Tamlin would take care of everything. I should watch from his side and observe. Easy enough, and perhaps a relief, to not be expected to speak or act. But it had been an effort not to look at the eye tattooed into my palm to remember what Rise had snarled at me. Tamlin had only returned the night before to oversee today's tithe. I tried not to take it personally, not when he had so much on his shoulders even if he wouldn't tell me much about it beyond what Ayanthe had mentioned. Seated beside Tamlin atop a day in the manor's great hall of marble and gold, I endured the endless stream of eyes, of tears, of gratitude and blessings for what I had done. In her usual pale blue hooded robe, Ayanthe was stationed near the doors, offering benedictions to those who departed, comforting words to those who fell apart entirely in my presence, Promises that the world was better now, that good had won out over evil. After twenty minutes, I was near fidgeting. After four hours, I had stopped hearing entirely. They kept coming, the emissaries representing every town and people in the spring court, bearing their payments in the form of gold, or jewels, or chickens, or crops, or clothes. It didn't matter what it was, so long as it equated to what they owed. Lucian stood at the foot of the day, tallying every amount, armed to the teeth like the ten other sentries stationed through the hall. The receiving room, Lucian had called it. But it felt a hell of a lot like a throne room to me. I wonder if he called it that because the other words. I'd spent too much time in another throne room. So had Tamlin. And I hadn't been seated on a day like him, but kneeling before it, approaching it like the slender, gray-skinned fairy slinking from the front of the endless line, full of lesser and high fame. She wore no clothes, her long, dark hair hung limp over her high, firm breasts, and her massive eyes were wholly black, like a stagnant pond, and as she moved, the afternoon light shimmered on her iridescent skin. Lucian's face tightened with disapproval, but he made no comment as the lesser fairy lowered her delicate, pointed face, and clasped her spindly, webbed fingers over her breasts. On behalf of the water race, I greet thee, High Lord, she said, her voice strange and hissing, her full, sensuous lips revealing teeth as sharp and jagged as a pike's. The sharp angles of her face accentuated those coal-black eyes. I'd seen her kind before, in the pond just past the edge of the manor. There were five of them who lived amongst the reeds and lily pads. I'd rarely glimpsed more than their shining heads peeking through the glassy surface, had never known how horrific they were up close. 
thank the cauldron I'd never gone swimming in that pond. I had a feeling she'd grab me with those webbed fingers, those jagged nails digging in deep and drag me beneath the surface before I could scream. Welcome, Tamlin said. Five hours in, and he looked as fresh as he had been that morning. I suppose that with his powers returned, few things tired him now. The water wraith stepped closer, her webbed, clawed foot a mottled gray. Lucian took a casual step between us. That was why he'd been stationed on the side of my day. I gritted my teeth. Who did they think would attack us in our town, our own home, on our own land? if they weren't convinced Hybern might be launching an assault. Even Ayanthe had paused her quiet murmurings in the back of the hall to monitor the encounter. Apparently this conversation was not the same as all the others. Please, High Lord, the fairy was saying, bowing so low that her inky hair grazed the marble. There are no fish left in the lake. Hamlin's face was like granite. Regardless, you were expected to pay. The crown atop his head gleamed in the afternoon light, crafted with emeralds, sapphires, and amethysts. The gold had been molded into a wreath of spring's fl first flowers, one of the five crowns belonging to his bloodline. The fairy exposed her palms, but Tamlin interrupted her. There are no exceptions. You have three days to present what is owed, or offer double next tithe. It was an effort to keep from gaping at the immovable face and the pitiless words. In the back, Ianthe gave a nod of confirmation to no one in particular. The water wraith had nothing to eat. How could he expect her to give him food? Please, she whispered through her pointed teeth, her silvery mottled skin glistening as she began trembling. There is nothing left in the lake. Amlin's face didn't change. You have three days. But we have no gold. Do not interrupt me, he said. I looked away, unable to stomach that merciless face. She ducked her head even lower. Apologies, my lord. You have to pay it. You have three days to pay, or bring double next month, he repeated. If you fail to do so, you know the consequences. Tamlin waved a hand in dismissal. Conversation over. After a final, hopeless look at Tamlin, she walked from the chamber. As the next fairy, a goat-legged fawn bearing what looked to be a basket of mushrooms, patiently waited to be invited to approach the day. I, tist I twisted the fit to Tamlin. Don't need a basket of fish, I murmured. Why make her suffer like that? He flicked his eyes to where Ianthe had stepped aside to let the creature pass, a hand on the jewels of her belt, as if the female would snatch them right off of her to use as payment. Tamlin frowned. Frowned. I cannot make exceptions. Once you do, everyone will demand the same treatment. I clutched the arms of my chair, a small seat of oak beside his giant throne of carved roses. But we don't need these things. Why do we need a golden fleece or a jar of jam? If she has no fish left, three days won't make a difference. Why make her starve? Why not help her replenish the pond? I'd spend enough years with an aching belly to not be able to drop it, to want to scream at the unfairness of it. His emerald eyes softened as if he read each thought on my face, but he said, Because that's the way it is. That's the way my father did it, and his father, and the way my son shall do it. He offered a smile and reached for my hand. Someday. Someday? If we ever got married, if I ever became less of a burden, and we both escaped the shadows haunting us. We hadn't broached the subject at all. Ianthe mercifully had not said anything either. We could still help her find some way to get that pond stocked. We have enough to deal with as it is. Giving handouts won't help her in the long run. I opened my mouth, but shut it. Now wasn't the time for debate. So I pulled my hand from his as he motioned the goat-legged fawn to approach at last. I need some fresh air, I said, and slid from my chair. I didn't give Ch Tamlin a chance to object before I stalked off the day. I tried not to notice the three sentries Tamlin sent after me, or the line of emissaries who gaped and whispered as I crossed the hall. Ianthe tried to catch me as I stormed by, but I ignored her. I cleared the front doors and walked as fast as I dared past the gathered lines snaking down the steps and onto the gravel of the main drive. 
through the latticework of various bodies, high fey and lesser fairies alike. I spotted the retreating form of the wraith heading around the corner of the house. Toward the pond beyond the grounds, she trudged along, wiping her eyes. Excuse me, I called, catching up to her, the sentries on my trail keeping a respectful distance behind. She paused at the edge of the house, whirling with preternatural pre, pre smoothness. I avoided the urge to take a step back as those unearthly features devoured me. Keep only, keeping only a few paces away, the guards monitored us with hands on their blades. Her nose was little more than two slits. Delicate gills flared beneath her ears. She inclined her head slightly. Not a full bow, because I was no one, but recognition that I was the High Lord's plaything. Yes? She hissed, her pike's teeth gleaming. How much is your tithe? My heart beat faster as I beheld the webbed fingers and razor-sharp teeth. Tamlin had once told me that the water rates ate anything. And if there were no fish left, how much gold does he want? What is your fish worth in gold? Far more than you have in your pocket. Then here, I said, unfastening a ruby-studded gold bracelet from my wrist. One Ianthe had told me better suited my coloring than the silver I'd almost worn. I offered it to her. Take this. Before she could grasp it, I ripped the gold necklace from my throat and the diamond teardrops from my ears. And these. I extended my hands, glittering with gold and jewels. Give him what you owe. Then buy yourself some food, I said, swallowing as her eyes widened. The nearby village had a small market every week, a fledgling gathering of vendors for now, and one I'd hoped to help thrive, somehow. And what payment do you require? Nothing. It's, it's not a bargain. Just take it. I extended my hands further. Please. She frowned at the jewels draping from my hands. You desire nothing. In return? Nothing. The fairies in the line were now staring unabashedly. Please, just take them. With a final assessing look, her cold, clammy fingers brushed mine, gathering up the jewelry. It glimmered like light on water in her webbed hands. Thank you, she said and bowed deeply this time. I will not forget this kindness. Her voice slithered over the words, and I shivered again as her black eyes threatened to swallow me whole. Nor will any of my sisters. She stalked back toward the manor, the faces of my three centuries tight with reproach. I sat at the dinner table with Lucian and Tamlin. Neither of them spoke, but Lucian's gaze kept bouncing from me to Tamlin, then to his plate. After ten minutes of silence, I set down my fork and said to Tamlin, What is it? Tamlin didn't hesitate. You know what it is. I didn't reply. You gave that water wraith your jewelry. Jewelry I gave you. We have a damned house full of gold and jewels. Lucian took a deep breath that sounded a lot like, Here we go. Why shouldn't I give them to her? I demanded. Those things don't mean anything to me. I've never worn the same piece of jewelry twice. Who cares about any of it? Tamlin's lips thinned. Because you undermine the laws of that this court when you behave like that. Because this is how things are done here. And when you hand that gluttonous fairy the money she needs, it makes me, it makes the entire court look weak. Don't you talk to me like that, I said, baring my teeth. He slammed his hand on the table, claws poking through his flesh. But I leaned forward bracing my own hands on the wood. You still have no idea what it was like for me to be on the verge of starvation for months at a time, and you can call her a glutton all you like, but I have sisters too, and I remember what it felt like to return home without any food. I calmed my heaving chest, and that force beneath my skin stirred, undulating along my bones. So maybe she'll spend all her money on stupid things. Maybe she and her sisters have no self-control. But I'm not going to take that chance and let them starve because of some ridiculous rule that your ancestors invented. She, Lucian cleared his throat. She meant no harm, Tam. I know she meant no harm. He snapped. Lucian held his gaze. Worse things have happened. Worse things can happen. Just relax. Tamlin's emerald eyes were feral as he snarled at Lucian. Did I ask for your opinion? Those words, the look 
he gave Lucian and the way Lucian lowered his head. My temper was burn a burning river in my veins. Look up. I silently beseeched him. Push back. He's wrong and we're right. Lucian's jaw tightened. That force thrummed in me again, seeping out, spearing for Lucian. Do not back down. Then I was gone. Still there, still seeing through my eyes, but also half looking through another angle in the room, another person's vantage point. Thoughts slammed into me, images, memories, a pattern of thinking and feeling that was old, clever, and sad, so endlessly sad, and guilt-ridden, hopeless. Then I was back, blinking, no more than a heartbeat passing as I gaped at Lucian. His head, I had been inside his head, had slid through his mental walls. I stood, chucking my napkin on the table with hands that were unnervingly steady. I knew who that gift had come from. My dinner rose in my throat, but I willed it down. We're not finished with this meal, Tamlin growled. Oh, get over yourself. I barked and left. I could have sworn I beheld two burned handprints on the wood peeking out from beneath my napkin. I prayed neither of them noticed, and that Lucian remained ignorant to the violation I had just committed. And that was the end of chapter 8. Y'all, Tamlin, oh my gosh, Tamlin's pissing me off. You know, I, like, I, 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 I swear a lot IRL, but in stuff like this, I try to uh, save it for exquisite moments like this. Tamlin is Pissing me off. Y'all. Oh my gosh. Ooh. My ancestors did it this way. So that's the only way it's allowed to be done forevermore. God, dude. Get over yourself. I, I swear Ionthe has some... Either either Tamlin is not who he is. Or Ionthe or something is twisting him. Like how he thinks that Ryze is twisting her... Uh, Fyra. I, I don't know. I don't know. We'll have to keep reading and going on, but dang, that's my thoughts for now. Y'all stay beautiful. Stay hydrated. We'll see you in the next chapter. Hopefully it's not as, I'm not as triggered as I once was on this one. <laughs> see y'all then. Bye.